Welcome to the Ask the Expert session for Azure AI. My name is Erin Dormeyer and I will be your moderator today. So today for the agenda, first we'll go through some logistics about what to expect in this session. We'll then go through the team introductions. We have a great set of both on camera moderators as well as people in the chat to answer your questions. So we'll go, go through that. Um, we have four main areas that we'll be able to represent today. We have Azure Machine Learning, Cognitive Services, Cognitive Search, and also Azure Bot Service. So most of the time will be spent answering your questions, and then we'll have a closing with, with some resources for you. So for some logistics, please use the chat to ask your questions. You can feel free to post anonymously or use your name. And remember to upvote your favorite questions. We'll work to try to prioritize the ones with the most upvotes. Um, we will answer your questions both verbally and on camera, and also we will have some um, answered on the chat. So at the end of the session, we will have some resources for you for more information. For etiquette for this session, um, this will be recorded, so please don't record it on your own, and we ask that you please don't spam the chat. Um, if you'll see on the next slide, we have the Microsoft Code of Conduct. We also put it into the chat so you can see that information, but please just, just be respectful is the, is the main point of the Code of Conduct. So next, let's meet the experts. I'm going to have each of the on-camera experts introduce themselves. So Anand. Hi, Erin. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Anand Raman and I lead the uh, program management team for uh, ML infrastructure team building Azure Cognitive Services at scale, uh, serving both the internal as well as the external customers. Uh. Thank you, Anand. Purnima? Thanks, Erin. Hi, everyone. I'm Purnima Devraj. I'm the product lead for Azure Machine Learning. We offer a platform for custom training, automated machine learning, and more. Thank you. Thank you. Gary? Hi everyone, my name is Gary Pretty. I'm a program manager on the conversational AI team, and that encompasses Azure Bot Service and also our tools and SDK, so things like Bot Framework Composer. Thanks, Gary. Luis? And finally, hi everyone, my name is Luis Cabrera. I am Group Program Manager for Azure Cognitive Search, a platform as a service component that allows you to create great search experiences. Great, thank you. We also have some great chat experts. We have Alec, who is an engineering manager for Cognitive Search. We have Kiji, who is a program manager for Azure Machine Learning. Fani is a program manager for Cognitive Services. And Merna is a marketing manager for Azure AI. And this slide shows what we have announced at Ignite and also some recent releases. So we'll leave this up while, we'll do, while we're doing the chat so you can have some reference of what we've recently released. So let's go into some questions. So first one, um, this looks like it's for the bot service. So Gary, what is the recommended way for developers to get started with building bots? Should they be starting with the composer or the SDK? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, last uh, last build, um, we GA Bot Framework Composer, um, which brings a, a whole new level of productivity for building bots. Um, and uh, Bot Framework Composer builds on top of the Bot Framework SDK. Um, our recommended approach now is that for people who are getting started building bots, that you start with Bot Framework Composer. You can get uh, so much done with Composer, and then it's extensible, so you can actually extend your bots using the SDK and underneath you're still building a full rich SDK application um, uh, right there on disk underneath Composer. So Composer is the place to start and then extend with the SDK. That sounds great. Thank you, Gary. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, this is for cognitive search. So Luis, can I make semantic search capabilities within an existing service or do I need to create a completely new service? Yeah, that's a, that's a great experience. Semantic search has to do with the ability to re-rank uh, content uh, so that you get the most meaningful re results based on, uh, uh, well, well, on semantics or meaning, right? Um, the good thing is that this is a process that occurs uh, at query time. So you don't have to re-index any of your content. If you already have a service in one of the regions where we have the preview for semantic search, you essentially just change a few query parameters and then you should be able to get uh, semantic ranking, semantic answers and captions. 
Great. Thank you, Louise. Um, Anna, we have a question that's um, it's pretty big one. So what are the key announcements for cognitive services at Ignite? Oh, um, we have listed here in the slide a bunch of them. Uh, uh, so I'll just call out uh, <clears throat> Uh, two or three of them. So I'll start with the uh, custom neural voice uh, that we have announced uh, that's generally available and essentially we are making uh, branded voices available and this is uh, one of the most uh, popular features in Ash by a lot of enterprises such as uh, uh, Progressive Insurance building the flow chatbot uh, with a branded voice uh, and BBC and so on and so forth. Um, this is one area that we have invested a lot, made sure that we are responsible in bringing uh, this and also making sure that we land them responsibly. So um, uh, to enable custom neural voice, you have to go through an application process with us and then we also showcase how you uh, make use of them in a very responsible way. That's uh, custom neural voice. Uh, a couple of those I want to call out uh, the form recognizer, uh, which is one of the most popular uh, services. Uh, uh, what we have done is we ex expanded the uh, number of human languages coverages from 9 to 73, uh, making sure it's available for all the global audience. Uh, two key features there. One is uh, making sure form recognizer is now uh, has the ability to uh, extract information from uh, passports worldwide as well as driver licenses so that you can eliminate a lot of the manual processes that you have to go through um, in terms of banking as well as in the uh, uh, hotel industry. So that's one. Uh, the third one I want to call out is uh, spatial analysis. Uh, so essentially uh, the model that we have been running in our face API, uh, we are bringing them into the video streams uh, with spatial analysis uh, such as face mask detection as well as making sure that you know you when our customers reopen their offices, restaurants, they do that in a responsible way. So the spatial analysis allows you to make sure you understand the social distance between the people so you can monitor that well. So I'll stop right here, Erin. So. Thank you, Anand. Um, our next question uh, on Azure Machine Learning for Pornema. Why do we need Synapse Spark in Azure ML? Thanks, Erin. Um, that's a good question. So when we talk to a lot of our customers, we know that a lot of our data scientists spend at least 60% of their time preparing data before they train their models. Now, currently, without having that Spark experience in AML, they have to switch between platforms to complete their end-to-end -end machine learning cycle. By offering Spark experience that's backed by Synapse in Azure Machine Learning, what we want to enable is a seamless experience for our data scientists to start with the data prep, complete the featureization on Spark environment, and switch to the right uh, compute of target for their training and inferencing. So this way they can complete the end-to-end -end machine learning uh, machine learning life cycle within Azure Machine Learning and not have to jump between platforms. So that's one of the main goal of launching this experience within Azure Machine Learning. Great, thank you, Purnima. Next question is, um, and this will likely go to Gary and maybe some input from Anand as well. Is there a relationship between Q&A Maker, Conversational AI, and Power Virtual Agents? Do they share technology? When should you use one over another? So Gary? Yeah, sure, this is a great question. So we have a broad range of uh, services that you can use to build bots within the Microsoft Conversational AI platform and to uh, add intelligence to them and power to them using the cognitive services. Um, the Bot Framework SDK actually sits underneath Bot Framework Composer and Power Virtual Agents. And really which one you start with today really depends on the type of audience that you are. If you're already on the Power Platform or maybe you have some business users users, maybe some citizen developers, Power Virtual Agent is an awesome place to start. And the great news is because it's all built on the same SDK, you can actually extend your Power Virtual Agents project using Bot Framework Composer today. Um, if you need um, more of a pro developer workflow, um, you need more flexibility and the full power of the SDK, then you can uh, absolutely use Bot Framework Composer today. But as I say, the great news is and the message here is that there is a lot of interoperability between them. In terms of Q&A Maker, you can actually extend your bots and really infuse the power and intelligence into them, as I said, using things like Q&A Maker or um, Lewis for language understanding. Uh, and uh, both uh, Power Virtual Agents and Composer allow you uh, natively to add capabilities such as Q&A Maker to your conversational experiences. 
Great. Thank you, Gary. And we have another good question. Um, and Purnima, you, you might be able to answer this one is curious thoughts on getting to pure ML versus traditional build model for train and analysis from from the model. Thanks, Erin. I think um, all of our customers come from different flavors. Some of them are trying to work on problems like forecasting where they might use traditional machine learning. And so they tend to prefer automated machine learning that gets them quickly get, uh, started with machine learning projects. But as they get into more complex use cases, they move into um, advanced training uh, models such as deep learning and more. So Azure Machine Learning offers customers the right set of capabilities irrespective of whether you're doing pure machine learning or traditional machine learning based on the use cases that you're trying to offer. And you can scale up your models starting from AutoML into custom training and be able to manage and deploy your models with the infrastructure that machine learning, Azure Machine Learning offers today. Great, thank you. This next one uh, is cognitive search, so that would be for Luis. What is the difference between a semantic answer and a semantic capture? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. So a semantic answer, imagine that you have a search box and you ask something like, uh, let's say, what is Azure Search, right? So the semantic answer, think of it as an instant answer that appears right away, right? Um, a semantic caption is really the best passage for a result uh, given the query. So you may have all the, all the rest of the results that you have sorted by relevance or, or semantic relevance, and underneath you will have a small caption uh, related to that, uh, uh, to that result that will allow you to quickly triage uh, uh, to understand you know, whether you should kind of go inside that document or not or in what way this is uh, relevant to the query that you just issued. Great, thank you. The next one for Anand, can you explain the new features in Form Recognizer and how they'd be used? Uh, sure, I, I briefly talked about it. I think the um, uh, if you think about form recognizer, we have uh, layout, we have custom as well as uh, we have pre-built. Uh, these are the three capabilities. Uh, so in the uh, layout, I think we have the enhanced table extraction um, as well as all the detection of checkboxes in another area. So that's coming. As I talked about, we expanded the uh, language coverage, which has been a big ask to uh, 73 languages, um, so that supports our global customers. Um, the key one is we have two pre-built models, one for uh, passports and the other one for uh, driver licenses uh, for worldwide customers. So those are the main ones that uh, uh, we have announced uh, recently. Great, thank you. Um, and for Pranima on Azure Machine Learning, uh, what are some of the benefits of using the Azure Arc enabled ML? That's a great question, Erin. We do see a lot of our customers are um, using Kubernetes, either whether they're using on-prem or multi-cloud uh, experiences, and their intention is to also use machine learning on top of Kubernetes. What we have done with this Azure Arc uh, for ML experience in AML is that you can now train your models on your Kubernetes cluster. You can use Azure Arc. Um, for Kubernetes clusters that's on-prem, multi-cloud, or Azure um, Edge as well. You can also use the managed Azure offering, which is Azure Kubernetes Service as well, if that's what you want to do in terms of training your model. Now, the way we have set up this feature is it's kind of separating the person of IT admin versus the data scientists. So we enable the IT admins to go set up the Kubernetes cluster as they do today. They're, they're used to the tools that Kubernetes offers. They can continue to use that to enable that um, Kubernetes compute into Azure Machine Learning. With that attached to Azure Machine Learning through Azure Arc, data scientists can just uh, focus on training the models by submitting those jobs on the compute cluster instead of having to learn the Kubernetes um, tooling themselves. So this is one of the seamless experience for our data scientists to be able to leverage the existing Kubernetes offering that customers use typically. Great, thank you. So Anand, let's jump back to you. We have another question on, is there a way to perform image analysis on images greater than four megabytes, which is currently specified in Computer Vision API? I don't know if you know that off the top of your head. Um, I have to check uh, specifically on that. I know that we have recently uh, increased the thing. Let me come back to that particular uh, okay. uh, question after checking, unless uh, someone in the chat like um, Fani can check and give an answer here. Yeah. Perfect. So next question on the bot service for Gary, how should we choose between Composer and Power Virtual Agents? 
Yeah, so really this comes back to, uh, you know, we touched on this a little bit in the uh, the previous uh, question. Um, and as I said, it really comes back to the uh, the type of audience for the uh, the developer, but I did talk about the uh, the extensibility of Power Virtual Agents today with Composer, uh, and maybe we should just uh, briefly describe that for folks who aren't familiar with what you can do. So today you can actually build a Power Virtual Agents project. You can get started really, uh, really very quickly. And actually now, since uh, I think since uh, build this year, you can now uh, click Open in Composer within your Power Virtual Agents project. Um, and that will actually then actually, uh, if you need to download Composer, then you can do that. But then you can open up your Power Virtual Agents project and extend it with uh, lots of the power the Bot Framework Composer offers. As soon as you're finished extending your project, making changes, then you can actually publish that back to your Power Virtual Agents project. And the real advantage here is you can actually have business users um, or citizen developers or uh, um, sort of Power Platform users collaborating with uh, developers who are using Composer, which is a phenomenal workflow. And it's a demand that we're seeing more and more um, of bringing Power Virtual Agents and Composer together. So quite often it's not a choice of um, which one do I use? It's a question of where do I get started and then where do I extend? Great, thank you, Gary. So next question on cognitive search for Luis. Does semantic search apply to scenarios where you search for documents like PDFs, or can I use it also in a scenario where I index a database like an e-commerce? Uh, that's that's actually a great question. So yeah, it, it applies to both cases. Uh, you will think, you know, just uh, um, that it will apply mostly to, to documents, right? Because there is more pros there, so therefore there is a little bit more meaning. But even in scenarios like uh, like e-commerce or sometimes you may have like a database, like a, let's say a support database, right? You will have, uh, for instance, a description of a product or, or maybe in the service ticket, it may say why it was open and things like that. Uh, so in each of these cases, it will apply. Um, by the way, semantic search will apply not only for like uh, what we will call questions like, you know, who is uh, doing X or, uh, you know, like when was this contract signed and things like that. But but even for, uh, let's say, a term like, uh, uh, I don't know, like um, outside furniture bag, uh, right? Like so, so this is a concept, right? It's a bag to put, uh, um, let's say, uh, the cushions for outside furniture, right? So so. This, the semantics concepts can be understood uh, by, by the system and rank not based on just which words appear on the term, but how they are used uh, within the, let's say, the e-commerce site. Thank you, Luis. Uh, next question for AML. How can customers benefit from the, the RBAC launch? So that would be for Pornima. Great. Thanks, Erin. That's a great question. So we do understand that customers have different level of security needs when it comes to their machine learning project. Um, the RBAC or role-based access control, it offers a finer granularity of control based on the role. For example, if it's an IT admin, you want to, uh, customers might want to enable experiences where they can go create and provision a workspace, create compute targets or create data sources. But for a data scientist, you might want to enable experiences that enables them to just submit jobs, but not necessarily creating a cluster. So every organization has different um, set of access control they want to enable based on the role. So the RBAC option that we have launched enables you to set up that finer access control for your machine learning projects with an AML. Great, thank you for that. Um, let me see, the next question is, um, this one would be for Bot, for Gary. Is it good practice to use the virtual assistant template and skills template to start creating a series of bots for an enterprise? Yeah, so another great question. Uh, so for a, some time now, we've had the Virtual Assistant Solution Accelerator, which uh, contains that Virtual Assistant template and a set of skills. Um, but for context, skills are just bots um, and any bot can consume another bot. So it's a way of having maybe your sort of core front door uh, virtual assistant and then extending that with one or more capabilities. So the Virtual Assistant Solution Accelerator is a great way to go if you're gonna go code first and develop with the SDK and certainly perfectly valid still today. I think I would say that we, what you are seeing is doing at the moment is infusing all of the things that we had in that Virtual Assistant Accelerator 
so um, the uh, pre-built skills, etc., and we're bringing them to the uh, sort of the composer world, um, so that you can actually take advantage of um, both the enterprise best practices that we've identified from working with customers, um, along with the productivity gains that composer brings. So <clears throat> a great way to start today might be to actually create a uh, composer project and then use the built-in UI in composer to add one or more skills, and the skills that you're adding could be those from the virtual assistant accelerator really to give you a, a jump start for any capabilities in there that you would like to uh, would like to use over time and I would suggest you know uh, between now and um, build keep an eye on our um, early adopters channel you can actually go in composer and you can enable our early adopters uh, feed and get our nightly builds you can take a look in there to see some of the innovations that we're starting to make where we bring more and more of the virtual assistant template into uh, composer natively as well thank you Gary this next question I'd love to to hear all of our chat experts view on it um, it's what would the career opportunities be for Azure AI and the IT operations team and cloud engineers for like non-developers? And how would you see the need for cloud engineers to be in the Azure AI field? So I'm not sure who wants to, to start, but I'd love to hear your feedback on that. Mom, I can, I can start a little bit, I think. Um, so um, I think we have a couple of my colleagues uh, here in this chat. Uh, Maddie and Mona, I think they have worked very hard to publish uh, a journey of Azure AI and that we can point links to. I think it's a good place for uh, uh, anyone uh, to start there to learn. So because uh, AI is such a cutting edge field uh, that uh, we want uh, everybody to get uh, into this. So uh, the goal for us is to democratize Azure AI and uh, um, whether you are a developer or not, uh, we have some best practices that uh, we will uh, we'll share with you. Uh, I think there are a few areas definitely uh, in, in the IT side, right? So for example, the um, uh, APIs we provide for anomaly detection, and those are very, very easy for you to learn and consume. Uh, we have some quick start tutorials in our Azure Docs that you can start using and then look at, if you have a time series data, you want to look at anomalies. So that's a good place to start. Uh, we also have a lot of low code, no code uh, tools. Uh, in the area of uh, bot services that uh, Gary can speak to. So I'll stop right here. Uh, Thanks. Any other thoughts? Yeah, like like just to complete the thought, right? Q and A Maker is a great tool, right? Literally, you just go to the portal with just a few clicks. You provide uh, what your information is, and all of a sudden you have a bot. So no, no need for any coding, right? So it's kind of exciting to see that. Uh, you know, stuff that only data scientists could do, not only developers can do, but uh, but anyone, you know, that, that can follow some documentation essentially, right? Great, thank you. Any other thoughts before we move to another question? I think to add to it from AML perspective, um, there are a lot of personas that come together to make a machine learning project work, right? There are IT admins that help set up provision workspaces, provision the data and the compute of target. And then there are data scientists that primarily data engineers and data scientists work together on data prep training. And there's also um, ML engineers or software engineers that help deploy those models as well. So there is definitely a role for every persona in this journey. As Anand and Lewis called out, there's also no code experiences that we have in Azure Machine Learning, for example, automated ML, where you don't have to know the details of machine learning training. You can just leverage auto ML to get started and then move on into custom training if that's what you wish to do. Great. Thank you for the insights. Gary, did you want to jump in as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would just uh, echo the comments around the, um, uh, the uh, the multiple personas. It's exactly the same inside the um, uh, conversational AI field. It's not just a case of developers more and more. Actually, we're seeing that the other personas have to work together uh, to build you know, awesome experiences. Everything from uh, content editors and you know, true conversational designers is a role that we're seeing emerging now as well. Um, and then extending with your more traditional developers uh, and Power Platform developers, as we heard with uh, Power Virtual Agents earlier on. Thank you, everyone. That was, that was good insights. So next we have an AML question on how can customers benefit from cross-experiment runs? 
It's a good question, Erin. Um, so this capability is mostly to improve data scientists productivity. For example, if you want to compare runs between two different experiments, you can quickly go to our UI, compare the runs, pick the metric you want to compare by and also save it as custom use that you can refer back later. Just makes it easier instead of uh, changing screens from the same view. You can compare runs from multiple different experiments for you. Great, thank you. Next question for Anand on cognitive services. Could you explain the face mask detection feature and what the difference between it, the face mask detection feature and face API and its spatial analysis? Oh, sure. Uh, the, the, there is literally no difference, right? The model underlying model is exactly the same. The, the face API is used for the image versus in spatial analysis, the video. The only difference is the JSON output uh, between those two. That's it. OK, thank you. And then we have one question for Luis. Can you continue to use filters with semantic queries? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way that semantic uh, ranking works is uh, you can still apply things like filters uh, uh, because it's um, think of it as two as two ranking steps. That is the what we call L1 or level one ranker that still uses the traditional let's say BM25 algorithm or syntax based algorithm that we um, that we traditionally use. And, and if you apply filters, it will be applied to that uh, or any other rules such as boosting. And then on top of that, we apply a, a, the semantic ranking models and uh, that work on the best results uh, and result, uh, sorry, and resort those results based on the meaning of documents. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Thank you. And now we have another question for AML. Um, AML and Azure Databricks both have comprehensive tool sets for ML development and ML ops. How do you side, decide which one to go for? So Purnima. That's a very good question, I would say. Um, so from what we've seen, customers do come from different flavors. There are customers who um, use Azure Databricks because it offers a premium Spark experience. It has the um, Databricks optimized Spark compute and also the managed Delta um, format uh, and data tables. And that's something our customers prefer. Some of our customers do work with big data even while training, so they prefer the Spark environment. If that's you, I think Azure Databricks does offer some of those experiences. And we've also built a deeper integration between Azure Databricks and Azure Machine Learning. So customers typically use Databricks when they get started with notebooks and data prep. Um, as they automate it, they do leverage AML pipelines in, uh, natively within Azure Databricks as well. There are customers in AML that prefer more of a Python environment uh, along with ML ops, and that's where we have all the toolings and infrastructure available for them to achieve that as well. Now, interesting with the Synapse Spark experience coming into AML, if you prefer to use a managed OSS Spark environment um, backed by Synapse in AML, you have this option to do that with the launch that we have today. Thank you, Purnima. Um, we're getting close to the end, so I'm going to ask one more question, and I'm not sure we're going to have time for another one after this. So um, this one I wanted to ask is for on the bot service for Gary. Are there best practices for migrating bots built with the SKK over to Composer? Uh, yeah, another another awesome question, and I think the uh, the main point to land here is this is not about uh, migration. Um, all of the uh, code that you've built using the SDK uh, is still perfectly valid and still works. It's built on what we would call our waterfall dialog stack, so you're using waterfall dialogues, component dialogues, um, all of those are still usable inside of Composer. It's just a question of how did you make them available inside of your Composer project to call and then have them uh, work side by side with any dialogues you build inside of Composer itself. Um, and where I would start there is looking at what we would call custom actions. So you can actually go and build actions that you can add to your conversational canvas. Um, and underneath, they are just dialogues. So quite often, you can just take your existing dialogues and you can lift and shift them over to your uh, Composer projects. We will be releasing some more best practices for doing this over the coming weeks. Thank you, Gary. And with that, we have only a minute remaining. So Maddie, could we go to the, the final slide for the resources? So thank you everybody for your great questions. Um, we really enjoyed talking with you today and thank you to all of our experts for answering all of these questions. We have some resources here and also in the chat, a lot of our great chat experts have given some resources for that. So we thank you for joining us today. Thank you.